cancerous germs? Well, Ellen White, uh, Ellen Gould Harmon, as she started out, is held to be a prophet by a traditional Seventh-day Adventists. Um, she occasionally said things that could be tested scientifically, and of course, that makes scientific questions about her statements part of the universe of faith and science. And this is, after all, the faith and science Sabbath school class. So we're going to look at uh, one of the classic things that has been out there and has been argued about in a number of different ways. Um, there are several options in viewing Ellen White and any given statement that she makes. Uh, in this particular case, the statement about cancerous germs. Number one, you can always say Ellen White was not really a prophet and her pronouncements can be safely ignored. That's one way of approaching it. Another way was that Ellen White really was really a prophet and God told her this and we should listen. And as a matter of fact, in the more extreme form, Ellen White said it and I believe it and that settles it. Number three, we can say Ellen White was really a prophet, but also sometimes said things she got from her environment, which are more, no more authoritative than what anyone else said. And this is one of them. And so, you know, if it doesn't fit, why we'll just kind of um, ignore it again. Another way of saying it is Ellen White was a prophet. And while we don't know exactly where she got this idea, we need to be respectful and careful as this may be one area where God revealed something to her and we would be ignoring it at our peril. And finally, there's an option that some of you may not have thought of, but um, some people have thought of. Ellen White was not a prophet actually, but she was a very sharp woman and we need to be careful not to dismiss her too quickly. Now, <clears throat> I want you to notice that since there are several option, uh, options and they can look at things in different ways, the opinions on the genuineness of the prophetic gift of Ellen White largely but not completely coincide with the respect we believe we should have for her. That is, some people will hold she had the prophetic gift, but you know, right here, we don't respect it. On the other, uh, because the, the prophetic gift was not ev on everything she said. Whereas there are people who will not believe in the prophetic gift at all, but will say uh, we need to respect it because she has a pretty good track record. The concept of cancerous germs is an interesting test case, perhaps having some bearing on our opinion of Ellen White. And most importantly, as we will see as we go through on our own actions. The data. Well, in the Ministry of Healing, uh, written in 1905, and this is available on the internet, I've put some references, but there are actually several different places you can get it from. So you're not limited to the reference that I give. Um, you can read a chapter uh, entitled Flesh as Food. Those who, eat the uh, those who eat flesh are but eating grains and vegetables at second hand. For the animal receives e from these things the nutrition that produces growth. The life that was in the grains and vegetables passes into the eater. We receive it by eating the flesh of the animal. How much better to get it direct by eating the food that God provided for our use. I'm giving you the passage and the paragraph ahead and two paragraphs behind just so that you get a good feel for the context. Flesh was never the best food, but its use is now doubly objectionable since disease in animals is rapidly increasing. Those who use flesh foods little know what they are eating. Often if they could see the animals when living and know the quality of the meat they eat, they would turn from it with loathing. People are continually eating flesh that is filled with tuberculosis and cancerous germs. And there is our phraseology and she continues tuberculosis cancer and other fatal diseases are thus communicated 
Continuing on, the, th the tissues of the swine swarm with parasites, swine are scavengers, and this is the only use they were intended to serve. Never under any circumstances was their flesh to be eaten by human beings. It is impossible for the flesh of any living creature to be wholesome when filth is its natural element and when it feeds upon every detestable thing. Often animals are taken to market and sold for food when they are so diseased that their owners fear to keep them longer. The very process of fattening them for market produces disease. Shut away from the light and pure air, and here you can hear echoes of, of the free-range chickens. Um, uh, <coughs> uh, breathing the atmosphere of filthy stables, perhaps fattening on decaying food, the entire body soon becomes contaminated with foul matter. And uh, there's more, uh, not quite in that vein now, it comes on to, you know, don't you feel bad for them and a few things like that. And, uh, 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 but that's the context of that phraseology, cancerous germs. And it's very clear, it's not accidental. You can get cancer from eating meat. Well, you can find that in the Life and Health, September 1, 1905, paragraph two. You can find it in the Ministry of Healing. I am not sure which one of those came first because they're both 1905. Um, and you can find it in the Ministry of Health and Healing, which is just excerpts from the Ministry of Healing. You can find it from Testimonies, Studies on Diet and Food, Ellen White Statements Concerning Cancer, Child Guidance. Obviously, it got picked up and put into several subsequent, uh, but that's just basically a quote. If you want to go to the original, it appears to be either the Ministry of Healing or Life and Health, and I'm not sure which, but Whichever one it is, obviously there's copying going on uh, deliberately, and I don't think particularly uh, harmful because she's copying herself. Uh, and uh, uh, so the Ministry of Healing gives you at least one of the two, if not the original, for that. Now there's another statement if you look for cancerous germs you'll find another uh, statement, and it's found in White E.G. 1, 1901, Letters and Manuscripts, Volume 16, Letter 1883, and again, if you, uh, it's on the internet, uh, at least at one place, and they, there's the Paulson Collection of Ellen White Letters, which also includes this exact same letter, and I, I don't think there's any difference, it's just uh, where you want to find it. Uh, and this one starts out, dear brethren and sisters, you ask in regard to meat eating. I will say that it is quite true that nearly all animal flesh is diseased. Many people are eating meat filled with consumption. Consumption is the old term for tuberculosis and cancerous germs. At the present day, animals are suffering from all kinds of deadly diseases. And then I'll just quote the next three paragraphs really quickly so that you have a flavor for what's going on there. Uh, the Lord has been teaching his people that it is for their spiritual and physical good to abstain from flesh eating. There is no need to eat the flesh of dead animals. After the curse was pronounced upon the human family, God permitted man to eat flesh meat. This he did that life might be shortened. The punishment of death has been pronounced upon the race and the permission to eat flesh meat was one of the means used by God to inflict this punishment. When the Lord took his people from Egypt, he did not give them flesh meat to eat until they mourned and wept in his ears, saying, what, who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the flesh which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic, but now our soul is dried away and there's nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. Then the Lord gave them flesh to eat. He sent them quails from heaven, but we read, while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. And uh, it goes on from there. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but that, that gives you a flavor of where that came from. Now, it would not be complete if we did not notice that Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4, which was a predecessor to the Ministry of Healing, and which um, 
according to uh, uh, Don McMahon, uh, whom we'll come uh, by later, uh, is actually the best substantiated of Ellen White's uh, 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 advice. Uh, and again, you can get this on the internet, at least at this place. Uh, in order to preserve health, temperance in all things is necessary. Temperance in labor, temperance in eating and drinking because of intemperance, a great amount of misery has been brought upon the human family. The eating of pork has produced scrofula, another term for um, tuberculosis outside of the lungs, leprosy, and cancerous humors cancerous humors. Now, for those of you who know your medicine well, you'll recognize the term humor. Uh, for those of you who don't, those are uh, bodily fluids. There are four of them. There's uh, uh, phlegm, there's blood, there's uh, bile, and there's black bile. Uh, and in fact, we still talk about people who have personalities like that. A phlegmatic personality, a sanguineous personality, that's a blood, um, a, uh, a choleric personality, that's bile, and melancholic personality, which is black bile. Um, <clears throat> so here it's called cancerous humors. Pork eating is still causing the most intense suffering to the human race, depraved appetites, crave these, those things which are most injurious to health. The curse which has rested heavily on the earth and has been felt by the whole race of mankind has also been felt by the animals. The beasts have degenerated in, and I'm sure that that's a misprint in the uh, source I got it from, uh, size and length of years. They have been made to suffer more than they otherwise would by the wrong habits of man. Um, and there's another uh, where I'll just quote the sentence so, that, so as not to get lost in the weeds, because if we quote the whole paragraph, and if you want to do that afterwards, you can do that, and it's interesting. Uh, an appeal to mothers, Battle Creek, Michigan, again. Uh, you can get this on the internet. And it, uh, the sentence in, in, of interest is, cancer is humor which would lay Darwin in the system of their lifetime is inflamed and commences its eating destructive work. I want you to notice that in 1864, in two different places, Ellen White refers to cancerous humor, or humors. In uh, Ministry of Healings, it's very clearly what happened to cancerous germs. Now, what happened in between? 1864 and 1901. Well, actually, Robert Koch reported that a germ which he believed, and we now think correctly, caused tuberculosis could be demonstrated using a special stain. It would turn the bacteria blue where everything else would turn kind of this beige color. And um, he could find it in every animal that he, or person that he checked that had uh, tuberculosis. And so what's happened is the tuberculosis is now found to be a germ. So now she talks about germs instead of um, uh, instead of humors. Now. Was she influenced by the scientific re reports? I don't know for sure. I would say probably, but I really don't know. Okay. Uh, uh, there's a book by Don McMahon and Leonard Brand. Actually, most of it, I think, is written by Leonard Brand. The Prophet and Her Critics, and it's a very worthwhile book. We've reviewed it here before. And in the book, it is argued, and I think correctly, that the what's of what she recommends are highly reliable. And that the why's are not always as reliable as far as we can tell. They're better than everybody else's why's, but that's probably because she got the what's better. 
Um, and cancerous germs to me seems to be more of a why. Don't eat meat because it has cancerous germs. And before that it was cancerous humors. Um, meat eating not being a good idea is more of a what? You shouldn't eat meat. Okay, well what about meat eating causing cancer? Because that was the real point of her saying all that stuff. It wasn't that there were cancerous germs, it's that if you eat meat you get cancer. Is she right? Well, can germs cause cancer? Depends on how you define germs, but I think that most people would say that viruses would fit enough to where, you know, she didn't have the term uh, viruses to choose from. And in fact, we know with virtual certainty that viruses can cause cancer and in fact do in some cases routinely. Roos sarcoma virus produces leukemia in chickens. And most chickens have it, by the way. <coughs> think Kentucky Fried. Um, Epstein-Barr virus, infectious mononucleosis virus, can cause uh, lymphomas, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and can uh, occasionally cause leukemia. So there's a couple of viruses, and that one happens to be human. Hepatitis C virus can cause um, liver cancer. Hepatitis B virus, the same. Uh, of interest, especially to her comments on appeals to mother, human papillomavirus can cause cervical cancer. In fact, is probably the single biggest cause of cervical cancer. That's right. Cervical cancer is a venereal disease. Nobody wants to talk about it because they are afraid that if they say that, a woman will say, oh, but I couldn't because I haven't been out with anybody. not wanting to admit that, well, once or twice I did, or perhaps her husband has and he's never said anything. And so they want everybody to get a pap smear regardless. And if you're wondering about Gardasil, it's a uh, vaccine to try to stop papillomavirus. It's supposed to get all, I'm sure it doesn't get all, but uh, it's supposed to get all of the uh, varieties of pap human papillomavirus that cause cervical cancer. So it's a big deal. And finally, of interest, there is an actual bacterium that causes stomach cancer, Helicobacter pylori, which, interestingly enough, I did not learn about in medical school because nobody knew about it. And that's new. Well, for some of you, uh, that's going to be old because you learned about it in medical school. But uh, time marches on. And the story of its discovery is a fascinating one where they tried and they tried and they tried to culture stuff and they said it isn't there and it isn't there. And finally somebody tried a special stain and the bacteria lights up and uh, they suddenly realize that it's there, number one, and number two, it causes ulcers, and number three, if those ulcers sit long enough, it can cause cancer. Okay, um, bad bacteria, interestingly, can apparently predispose to cancer. And uh, for this, it's a, uh, I'm going to give you a YouTube, I know, that's not, very uh, scientific, but uh, in my defense, it comes from mainstream media, so it must be correct. <laughs> the area scientists are on the hunt to discover how a world lurking within us may play a vital role in the war against cancer. Only on 5 Tonight, Julia Goodrich takes a look at the trillions of germs we all harbor and why bacteria may be the best medicine.
It's really easy. A year ago, Audra Katz was diagnosed with breast cancer. But before she got treatment, she gave UCSF a stash of her germs. They gave me the kit. I was able to do it at home. It was a couple of swabs. It's the new frontier of health in medicine. In samples taken from her mouth and gut, Audra handed over a treasure trove. Her microbes, along with samples from other breast cancer patients, may hold the key to diagnosing, treating, even preventing the disease. I think that we will find that they hold a key place in our understanding of cancer. About 100 trillion microbes, that's about two to six pounds worth, live in or on the human body. These are bacteria, fungi, viruses, and other organisms. Dr. John Schwartzberg at Cal says not all our germs are bad. Most are beneficial. They break down food, teach our immune system to recognize danger, even produce anti-inflammatory compounds. These organisms are absolutely necessary to be living in us for us to survive. Our good and bad germs mix without problem, but in women with breast cancer, the mix is off. In one study, their breast tissue had lower levels of a protective germ and higher levels of possibly damaging microbes. So there are differences in breast tissue of people who have cancer compared to people who don't. Dr. Laura Esserman is overseeing the research. She says there are all kinds of colonies of bacteria that live synergistically in our bodies. And while much is unknown, one way to mess them up, antibiotics. The antibiotics used inappropriately are extremely dangerous because they alter our microbes. Cultures that get rid of bacteria are plagued by autoimmune and allergic diseases. And research shows women who use lots of antibiotics are at an increased risk of breast cancer. Doctors now wonder whether cultivating or maintaining a healthier mix of microbes could reduce the risk. Will that help us prevent breast cancer? That's actually that's the question of the day. Another big question, whether you can manipulate your microbes or microbiota to improve cancer treatments. So our therapies are good, but they could always be better. Dr. Ami Bhatt is a professor of medicine and genetics at Stanford. I'm very excited about investigating whether or not we can turn up the effectiveness of certain drugs that we already know are pretty good in cancer by changing the composition of the gut microbiota. In the meantime, Bott and her team have changed their lifestyle. I am actually very loath to take antibiotics unless I really need them. They eat more plants and fewer processed foods. It's what our microbes prefer. Well, maybe I should go home and eat more fiber or I should use fewer products with antimicrobials. I've become a lot more health conscious, um, especially about what my microbes need. As for Audra? These microbes, they're there. We need to figure out how to access them to potentially help us. Julia Goodrich, KPIX5. Scientists with the National Institutes of Science are also on board. They're collecting all the microbes in the human body, raising the possibility that one day they may be used to treat disease. So, let's see if I can get this going again here. There. But I want to point out that, that all of that is not fair to the passage itself, except for possibly H. pylori. And the reason why it's not fair to the passage is the point Ellen White was making was not the generic one that viruses or bacteria could cause cancer, but that eating meat could cause cancer. Didn't really matter to her. You remember she used cancerous humors, used cancerous germs. Um, you could almost say interchangeably depending on the uh, uh, era that she's writing in. And that raises an interesting question. What kind of cancer would meat eating cause? Well, lung cancer was much less common in her day and is mostly, probably about 90%, caused by smoking. Maybe 95%, but it's, it's a high number. Breast cancer is a possibility. A colon cancer is a possibility. I mean, after all, that's where all that stuff goes. Uh, maybe cancer in general is a possibility. 
And the question that can be asked is, is cancer caused by eating meat? Well, now my own take on all this, but well, before I do that, there, escape, let's look at some of the evidence I was able to find. I just did a Google search on cancer in meat consumption. And this is courtesy of Google, so uh, scholarly articles for cancer and meat consumption, and it has three of them, and we'll go over all of them. Um, processed meat consumption has also been strongly linked to a higher risk of stom stomach cancer. The World Health Organization has classified processed meats. It's interesting because stomach cancer in the United States has gone way down. Um, in China, it's still a huge problem. Uh, I'm not sure I can tell you exactly why, because it seems like we probably eat more salami than they do. Um, uh, the World Health Organization has classified processed meats, including ham, salami, bacon, and frankfurts, I assume that's frankfurters, as a group one carcinogen, which means that there is strong evidence that processed meats cause cancer. Okay, well, let's look. Uh, here is, let's see, meat consumption and risk of colorectal cancer, a meta-analysis of prospective studies. And this is in the International Journal of Cancer, 2006. Larson and uh, Wolk, if you're looking for it. Uh, I'll try to see if I can get this into the, uh, uh, underneath the uh, uh, references. Uh, Accumulating epidemiologic evidence indicates that high consumption of red meat and processed meat may increase ri risk of colorectal cancer. Aha! We quantitatively assess the association between red meat and processed meat consumption and the risk of, wait a minute, red meat. Red meat, that's beef, right? Uh, depending on the cut, maybe a little pork. So, pork sometimes thought of as white meat. Um, <coughs> Uh, in a meta-analysis, so they're looking at a whole bunch of different studies, and they have um, they have a bunch of numbers of stuff there. And the risk is 1.28 for red meat and 1.20 for processed meat. In other words, you get one and a quarter more, one and a fifth of the risk, more or less, um, for red meat. Uh, is that red meat compared with everything else, including chicken? Um, it sounds like if you just read that, that's probably the case. What would be interesting is to see red meat compared with vegetarians. Well, let's uh, remember this. We've just stolen these straight from the internet. Um, here is this is from the JAMA, and let's see if I can find it here. Meat consumption risk of colorectal cancer, 2005. Consumption of red meat and processed meat has been associated with uh, colorectal cancer in many, but not all, epidemiologic studies. To examine the relationship between recent and long-term meat consumption and the incidence of colon and rectal cancer, so that's their objective, and they have a, they list the cohort that they've been studying and um, they've identified uh, 1,667 incident colorectal cancers, new, in their population. And um, they just kept measuring and a high intake of red and processed meat reported in 1992 and 1993, so at the beginning presumably of the uh, study, was associated with higher risk of colon cancer after adjusting for age and energy intake, but not after further adjustments for body mass index, cigarette smoking, and other covariates. So apparently some of that's accounted for by smoking. Um, maybe most of it. But again, look at this, and ratio of red meat to poultry and fish. Well, that's not helping us very much, is it? So, 
long-term consumption of poultry and fish was inversely associated with risks of both proximal and distal colon cancer. So apparently there is some relationship even here, and the relationship is 1.71. So that's over one and a half times the risk, right? Well, let's, um, let's see for another one here. And meat consumption and colorectal cancer risk, dose response, meta-analysis of epidemiologic studies, and this is the International Journal of Cancer again in 2002 before either of the other two. And uh, again, you're talking about red meat. Red meat, not comparing red meat to vegetarian, which makes a little more sense. Um, so if red, average red meat intake is reduced to 70 grams per week in these regions, colorectal cancer risk would hypothetically reduce by seven to 24%. What happens if it's completely cut out? Well, of course, um, the Adventist Health Study has been working at this kind of stuff. And um, this is a findings for cancer. And this is findings for everything for cancer. And if we go down here, you can read a number of stuff. But let's uh, lung cancer, obviously. Uh, Consuming fruit is protective for squamous carcinoma and adenocarcinoma of the lung. Um, so eat a lot of fruit, I guess. Um, it doesn't say anything about meat in this setting. Stomach cancer, 17 new cases of stomach cancer. Um, it's a small number, so they have a hard time saying too much. Fruit seems to have a difference there. Well, I guess we better eat more fruit. Um, unless you're already eating a lot. Pancreatic cancer, 40 new cases of pancreatic cancer. After adjusting for smoking habits, which apparently has quite a bit of influence, researchers have found protective for those who consume legumes, vegetarian protein products, those old uh, uh, fake meat stuff, uh, dates, raisins, or other dried fruits. And uh, so you get your veggie meat, I guess. Um, and of course, pancreatic cancer is one of the more difficult ones to cure. Now, it doesn't say anything about specifically about meat itself. Uh, colon cancer. Uh, those who ate beans, it says beans help. Musical fruit, so. Um, you can uh, toot a little more, I guess. Um, um, and the individuals who ate flesh foods defined as meat, fowl, and fish several times each week had a somewhat higher risk for colon cancer. So you can get it with, with meat, fowl, or fish. On the other hand, those who ate more fiber decide uh, defined as indigestible carbohydrates found only in fruits and vegetables. Interestingly, bran doesn't count, I guess. I'm not sure why. Experienced a 40% reduction in the risk of colon cancer. That's what's that. Uh, risk of about 1.6 or something like that, if you eat meat in that setting. Uh, bladder cancer. Cigarette smoke, no surprise there. Frequent consumption of beef is associated with more than a twofold risk of cancer of the bladder. Who knew? Prostate cancer. Um, dried fruit helps. Let's see. Consuming fish more than once a week may increase the risk of prostate cancer by 50%. Whoa! Um, so much for that pisco-vegetarian stuff, huh? Um, now, of course, um, apparently it doesn't have too much difference on overall mortality, but uh, uh, 
Um, but it sounds like there are problems with fish there. I haven't seen anything wrong with uh, fruit yet. Uh, breast cancer, no clear association between dietary factors and breast cancer were found. However, the researchers noticed that all expected association with many of the well-established risk factors held for, true for the Adventist population, including socioeconomic sta status, maternal history of breast cancer, age of the birth of the first child, years of menstruation, uh, so they're saying uh, this isn't distorted, obviously. It's a pretty, you know, Adventists are pretty much like everybody else in that regard. Um, now, they have this handy dandy summary here, and this is meat. And uh, this first one is colon cancer. Individuals who ate meat several times a week each week had a 60% higher risk. Now, there's no significant, no significant, no significant. Uh, the, the gray ones are. are small numbers, and that's why they're not as impressive. Breast cancer, prostate cancer, apparently not much difference, except um, there was that fish thing. Uh, although, uh, that will be interesting to see if it holds up in another study. And I understand there is another study going on. Uh, lung cancer, um, passing current smoking risk, of course. But let's see, the next one is bladder cancer, frequent consumption of beef was associated with more than twofold risk. Um, pancreatic cancer, no significant association, and ovarian cancer, meat eating was associated with higher risk in postmenopausal women. So after menopause, you got to quit your meat. Okay. Well, that's interesting, shall we say. Now, let's see if I can get this to work now. My own take is I don't think Ellen White's authority stands or falls on whether germs can cause cancer. She didn't care. Uh, she used one term early and one term late, and I'm not sure that I can make that much difference on it. I tend to be respectful of even the statements she makes that are not backed up with I was shown. And um, I think that uh, this makes an interesting research project. Stomach cancer is at least partly caused by H. pylori. I think that one we can be pretty sure of. Um, and viruses can definitely cause other cancers, and we've been a few, through a few of them. More importantly, for our purposes, there seems to be good evidence that meat eating can cause cancer, whatever the mechanism is. Colon, bladder, ovarian cancer. If you compare meat eating with no meat eating at all, rather than compare meat with fish or meat with chicken. Um, and you can ask the question, is this mediated by traditional germs? Mm. Is it mediated by viruses? Is it mediated by more bad germs and good germs, which would still be cancerous germs? Um, and I think this would be a good research project for somebody. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Was the understanding of cancer in the 1800s pretty much the same as what we call cancer today? So when she said it causes cancer, she was talking about the same things we would be I think talking so. about. I mean, there may be some marginal changes, but very little. Uh, cancer has been known ever since it was called Karkinos back in uh, Greece. Karkinos, in case you're interested, is crab. and. Uh, uh, it was because if you looked at some of the cancers, they have these little kind of tentacles that reach out. Um, uh, that's where we get the term carcinoma from. And if you're wondering what cancer means in Latin, it means crab. Uh, doesn't meat eating slow down the motility rate in the gut to where there could be more exposure than if they're uh, 
we compare it to a, a more fiber diet, which kind of moves things more quickly through the Well, I noticed that meat and fiber are two separate uh, risk or non-risk factors, however you want to put that, uh, in the Adventist Health Study. So apparently, uh, you do better if, you, if you're going to eat meat, if you eat a bunch of fiber too, that helps. But, you know, if, if, you're, if you're not going to eat meat, probably you do a little better with fiber as well. So, you know, and if you're, if you're eating enough fiber or you're not eating enough fiber, you don't change that, but you cut out the meat consumption, that helps. So, uh, and the other thing that's interesting is that a high meat diet is, by, is generally speaking a low fiber diet anyway, because meat has no fiber. And you fill yourself up on stuff that, that allows your stool to get concentrated. And, and uh, you know, does it change the gut biota? Is that part of what we're dealing with? Uh, do the pigs have special germs that we really don't want? I don't know. Uh, what, uh, you know, those are interesting research questions. I think that the main point she was making, though, that meat increases the cancer incidence is true whether or not we figure out exactly how it works. And the obvious thing is, yeah, if you don't want cancer, maybe um, cut down or eliminate your meat content. Comment over here. And do we have anybody else? Uh, it's been interesting to follow this uh, study of Adventists through the years when I was younger before the Adventist study, I'm speaking of the first one, the leading one that is referred to so often about Adventists living longer and uh, sometimes uh, misquoted and uh, exaggerated, but uh, still the data is right there. Uh, that is, uh, I've noticed, and maybe this is subject on my part, but when I was younger and uh, and before that study, there seemed to be an awful lot of jokes about gluten steaks and all this other stuff. And the tone seems to have uh, moderated considerably because, boy, is there anything more important than living uh, longer and so on. Uh, uh, this means so much, and uh, uh, so we address other questions when we want to be humorous. Uh, but it's, uh, I've noticed, at least I, I think I've noticed that uh, we don't make so much fun of uh, some of White, or and Ellen White herself. Uh, people are more cautious about making fun of her yeah. now because, hey, you live longer if you follow uh, some of her advice. And then this, this, this uh, affects every one of us in a very intimate way. Well, you know, Don McMahon made a similar observation. There's actually two books. One that's written purely by Don McMahon, which just went over. And then there's another book where he wrote a chapter of, which kind of summarized what he'd written in the other book. And the rest of it is written by Leonard Brand. Um, and uh, Don McMahon writes in his introduction that, you know, he grew up traditional Adventists, and uh, there were things you did not do because Ellen White said so. And, uh, you know, as time go went on, apparently in where he was from, which is, I understand, is mostly Australia, um, maybe all Australia, that, that, that people kind of thought that, well, she was a little too restrictive, and, you know, we needed to update, and that, uh, <coughs> Uh, Adventist did. And then in the meantime, he's looking at the nutritionists and they're all saying, well, you need to do this and you need to do that. I've heard that before. <laughs> and, and so you're seeing a very interesting pattern where the Adventists are drifting out towards the uh, more liberal end of the spectrum. And the non-Adventist scientists are kind of coming around to the Adventist point of view. 
uh, not realizing that they're doing so, of course, and doing so strictly on the basis of, of science. And so you have this very interesting phenomenon. And what he did basically in the book was quantified it. He went through and he said, Ellen White predicts this and this and this and this and this, you know. And he had, I think, like 25 or 24, something like that. Uh, I think it was 25. Uh, different things that she said in Spiritual Gifts, which is the original presentation. And it was remarkable that I think that 24 of them could be supported, which is just mind-blowing if you think about how lucky you are. By the way, you, you know what the one that she couldn't, that he couldn't support was? was uh, eating, uh, fruits, and fruits and vegetables together. And if you go back and read what she says, she says at the end of it, we always eat fruits and vegetables in separate meals. That's our practice. There's nothing there that says, this is from the Lord. I saw, or anything like that. Just this is the way we do it. Which, you know, maybe that's something that uh, uh, was just a practice. Uh, maybe that's something that uh, uh, that God showed her, but she never said anything about exactly how she got it. On the other hand, I, I think that, number one, it would be nice to know if it's true. And number two, I'd like to know what fruits and vegetables are so that I can separate them. <laughs> <laughs> Is a tomato a fruit or a vegetable? vegetable. What? Well, uh, yes. you know, I mean, if, if, if we're thinking about separating these things, we need to know, are avocados fruits or vegetables? Uh, because I'm serious, you know, if you're going to live an extra six months, if you do this kind of thing, it'd be nice to know what you're supposed to do. <laughs> uh, comment here? Just keep talking, it'll come up. Okay. Um, you hear the word, it's processed food, and you hear that, and it automatically just puts it, uh, whatever it was, in a bad category. But the word process needs to be defined, and I was wondering if, yeah, probably not an easy job, but how would you define process in terms of what we need to know for whether it's good or bad? Is flour processed food? <laughs> is bread processed food? Well, apparently bread is, is okay. Yeah, we've got to comment back here. Oh, I didn't, uh, I didn't want to comment on the processing if you wanted to finish up sure, that. Sure, no, go ahead. Um, so there's, uh, there's uh, like paleo, you know, there's, there's dietary trends, paleo diet, for example, and um, there's argument made that the studies, uh, like, like especially Adventist, not especially, but as an example, Adventist health studies showing the benefits of, of vegetarian foods versus meats, that those studies are not valid because these are, re are retrospective studies in which there's self-selection bias where people who are vegetarian also have other health practices. Um, and, and well, that's that easy. Instead of just being a vegetarian, be an Adventist. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> that should do it. Um, and uh, and, and uh, I don't know about this, but I've heard that prospective studies don't, you know, like feeding studies don't show such strong correlations or that, you know, things like cholesterol are, are as bad as we used to think, et cetera. Any, any comments? Yeah. Um, this is, if it's not very carefully guarded against, can turn into therape therapeutic nihilism. What I mean by that is, um, let's uh, take it into a different realm, which is controversial in its own way, but not this way. Um, they did a study showing that if you take people who have had cardiac arrest and who have not woken up yet, and you cool them to 32 to 34 degrees centigrade, that 
you get better brain function uh, than if you just leave them at room temperature or at, uh, at normal body temperature. Okay? And then somebody did another study and they found out that it, if you cool them to 34 to 36 degrees, you get just about the same um, uh, results as if you cool them all the way down to 32, which is, you know, makes the job a lot easier. Um, and I'm sure some enterprising idiot is going to cool them between 36 and 37, and it's going to show that there's no difference between that and 35 and 36, statistically, and then somebody's going to cool them between, you know, get them below 37 and compare them with 37 to 38, and they're going to find no statistical difference. And basically what they're going to do is, by using small enough steps, prove that it really doesn't matter where we know that if you do 32 to 34, you get a big benefit. Something is wrong with this way of th thinking about. Uh, you know, you, you, can't, you can't do small enough steps and, and say that, uh, that there's no big difference. It's, it's, it's like the difference between a minute after sundown and two minutes is not very much. And the difference between two minutes and three minutes is not very much, and so forth. But I'm going to tell you something, that the difference between the minute after sundown and midnight is a whole lot of difference in terms of how much light you have. How does that relate to prospective and retrospective? Well, uh, um, I would like to see what kind of uh, retrospective study, uh, what kind of prospective studies they're talking about. Because if all you're doing is taking out meat and you're putting in cheese instead, there may not be any difference. Y you may need to go to a, a more a typical uh, vegetarian or vegan diet rather than rather than just simply shuffle the protein stuff around. In other words, what, what happens a lot of times is people will just take and substitute something else for the old meat and otherwise ch not change a thing. Uh, and I think if you're going to try to do a diet that's going to make a difference, you really should be doing uh, major changes and then start asking which parts of it make how much difference. Um, and so uh, I would like to see what kind of prospective dietary changes they were doing before I would uh, sign on to their, uh, I mean, it, think about it this way. <coughs> if people are not careful, they'll have, uh, they'll do that kind of thing with smoking. You know, uh, we'll do a prospective study on smoking because that's the only thing that will really convince us. And, I mean, smoking and cancer is just, you know. Huge. Let's, uh, you know, one time, Medi-Cal actually tried to take nitroglycerin off the formulary because there were no double-blind placebo-controlled studies that proved that it worked. <laughs> there are also no double-blind placebo-controlled studies that prove that jumping off a cliff is harmful to your health. You know, at some point, see, what's happening is there are people who don't want some things to be true, and so they'll try everything they can not to make it true. And I think you have to, you really have to look at the details before you're going to be sold on that one. Uh, if it is all the other stuff that goes along with it, well then, I guess maybe we should be selling the whole package. I've heard people say that once before. Um, uh, but it, there's, I mean, when you have people that live seven, eight years longer than the average population, they're doing something right. And it may not be all meat, but I think some of it is. Um, I'd just like, to, uh, one more thing I'd like to point out. Uh, I, I just don't want to go past too quickly, and that is, 
legume, high, high level of legume consumption and uh, uh, pancreatic cancer, the strength of that association, a uh, protective association, is one of the strongest that I've ever seen in nutrition. It's, it's a 30-fold difference. And I mean, that's even higher than, like, than cigarette you know, smoking and lung cancer. It's, it's just unbelievable. Now, the, the numbers, I think, are small. So it may turn out to be it's really more like 10. But I'll take so, 10. Sure. Well, in the whole package of Christianity and Adventism, we have trust and divine power that, that goes along with this whole package. And we, we seem to be talking just in the mechanical sense of dietary here, but how do we quantify you know, something like that? You know, which has to me, to me, has to be a huge portion of the deal. Let's see, actually, yeah. Um, I, I agree with you that, um, that, there, that I think that if you're going to measure it, you're going to find out that, uh, that trust in divine power, if you're a Baptist, makes a difference. Right. You know, um, uh, and uh, people don't necessarily like that, but, uh, you know, that's too bad, I'm, you know. I think that there is a lot of anxiety reduction, especially if you take it seriously enough to actually believe it. That is to say that you are able to simply allow God to manage it. You do what you can and then you let God take care of the rest. There is a great, I, I, have, I can see this in a mechanical sense, um, where I have patients who are very anxious about their having heart disease and they want me to tell them, no, I'm not going to die. Well, I can't tell them that. I mean, you could, you know. Uh, I, and I can't tell them that and be honest with them. Um, but I can, if somebody is religious, say, do you believe in God? And I can say, okay, then this is one of those times where we're going to do everything we can. I'll do everything I can. You do what you can. And then at that point, we step back and we let God take care of it. If I have an atheist, I can't do that. And granted, I don't think I'm ever going to have a study where I can show that that makes a difference. Because how do you do that? How do you judge? Well, they really didn't believe in God, I, you know. Uh, but, uh, and, and, you know, believers do die as well, so you know it's not going to be 100%. Um, you know, and atheists sometimes survive bad illnesses, uh, especially if their doctors, you know, work hard at it. But, um, but it seems intuitive that it, that it helps and if it helps a little bit here and it helps a little bit there and people who believe in a God are willing to let, you know, let him have the f fun and let them, um, let's say, smoke less and drink less and exercise more and uh, that there's this kind of internal reinforcement, the whole package does actually work. And I think that Ellen White zeroed in on a point which we sometimes fail to miss. It isn't that we believe all the right doctrines. It's that we trust in God. And uh, I think it's uh, fair to point this out because our sermon today was about, and will be, I guess, for those of you who can make it, um, it will be about um, whosoever believeth in him hath everlasting life. But beyond that, God wants us to have life more abundant right here. And there's some fairly good statistical stuff to back it up. Um, I've, I've had a personal opportunity to watch what's happening in these areas 
Uh, not that I have been active, but my son is a leader in lifestyle medicine nationally. And it's very interesting. Uh, Loma Linda carries with it baggage that slows down moving ahead in these areas as compared to other places. Uh, he's told me a number of times in frustration, Dad, Harvard's way ahead of us in buying into what Ellen White demonstrated as the best in healthful living because they looked at the evidence. Whereas here you have the history of the white lie and so on with a fair amount, and I think I'm accurate in saying this, of resistance to going with what is being shown over and over again in terms of healthful living. And there are other pieces of that. that some of the recent, some of the recent uh, studies have shown that actually a vegetarian fish diet is a little bit superior to the straight vegetarian diet. But that great, gets a great deal of resistance from people who s feel that anything that yeah. well, has, blo has, has blood in it should never it's, be consumed. Yeah, except for bladder cancer. And it, it's been interesting <laughs> to watch this develop. And uh, Yeah. Uh, well, no, uh, well there, there is a great deal of resistance uh, to, well, what happens, I think, is people who believe don't feel like they really need any more evidence. And so therefore they kind of step out of the scientific realm for a while. And people who don't believe need to have it proved because the reason, part of the reason they don't believe is because they wanted to do their own thing and they didn't like the recommendations that were made. So you have, uh, you have a certain paralysis on both sides of the issue. And we actually had this brought up uh, in class when we discussed Ellen White and cheese. And the, the people, uh, you know, there is all kinds of data that's out there and nobody here wants to touch it because the conservatives are afraid they're going to find out that it really doesn't matter. And the liberals are going to f afraid that they're going to find out that it really does matter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're nailing it. <laughs> yes. Uh, you might know, I think probably all you do know, uh, or some of you, that last National Geographic has an article by Dan Butner. Uh, where he revisited, uh, I believe it was four of the blue zones, including Loma Linda. And uh, nothing especially new there. There was one sentence which I don't know how to interpret. He's going back to the original study of, uh, you know, Adventists live longer. Uh, and says, and, and to be an Adventist adds two years after he's talked about the diet. And I don't know if that refers to uh, the confidence factor, I, uh, I suspect that a person who uh, is at peace with God uh, probably would live longer than one who is, is uh, uncertain about uh, his future uh, and so on. But uh, I just thought I'd throw out, uh, you might want to look at that sometime. Uh, but th there is a study that's been going on here and I just don't know the details about it the effect of religion on on uh, health. And we, we haven't looked at this, the results of that. I, I mean, I'm part of it, I know that mm -hmm. the, the, the study goes on, but uh, uh, I think there's probably a factor there that uh, may be significant. Yeah. Well, uh, the interesting thing is if you go back to the original Blue Zone, because I read that, that I'm not sure I read the entire book, but I read a good share of it at least because I was interested. And one of the things I noted is that when they talk about Loma Linda, they're not actually talking about Loma Linda. They're talking about faithful Adventists. 
And to give you an example, one of the people that they had in their little universe there was a lady out in uh, Arizona who was, I think, 80-something years old and was living with her mother, 112. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> I, I suspect that the mother is a dependent by now, but <laughs> but uh, but the point was that 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 you know they were specifically making the connection between belief and lifestyle and and living that, you know, somebody who comes in here who's, um, uh, I don't know, Episcopalian and doesn't really, you know, just got hired because that's what, uh, the, that's what some off, uh, opening they had was. And uh, they're not really in the group that they're talking about, or an atheist, for that matter, that that what you're really talking about is people who follow the lifestyle and who believe, uh, well, who profess to believe, because it's awfully hard to tell what people actually believe, you know, but, uh, but who believe in the, the church's message. Those were the people they're talking about. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I found fascinating is that uh, there are two islands, and one peninsula, and one peninsula on an island, and basically Loma Linda is the only one that has a freeway going through it. <laughs> Which is, I, I found fascinating. Uh, fascinating about the Loma Linda study also is that uh, heredity uh, is doesn't seem to be a factor like it is in these other areas. That is true. Uh, it's, that is it's, true. It's really Heredity doesn't seem to be a factor yeah. and isolation from modernity. Well, I suppose you could say that Adventists participate less in uh, common culture than most other people. Uh, maybe there is an isolation from uh, common culture and maybe that may be a good thing. But <laughs> anyway, it is the only study you can say it's not hereditary, at least it doesn't appear hereditary. Yeah. In so if I were to kind of sum it up, I would say, I don't think Ellen White's reputation is at stake here, but I think she mm -hmm. probably got it right regardless. Uh, and it's nice to know that it doesn't have to be a spiritual life or death matter in order for you to bet on the Ellen White horse. Yes. Um, there's someone, someone visiting from Southwestern who's on the presentation. Somebody visiting from Southwestern? From Southwestern. Uh, spoke last night and again uh, at Vespers today to talk about the 1919 Bible Conference and how mm -hmm. it affected the mm -hmm. attitude of the church to, to Ellen White. And he did a good job yet last night. It was, I think you'd find it interesting. It seems a little bit on the subject. It is. I, I, I'm unfortunately going to have to miss it. But So um, we'll see what we can do next week. I'll send you an email.